Okay, so we will come back to Proverbs chapter 16 at the end of the sermon. But for now, can you please turn to Galatians, or sorry, turn to uh, Philippians chapter 2, just for now. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, and we'll get to that uh, in a moment. But we are continuing the series on the fruits of the Spirit. We're near the end now. And I'll just quickly read to you in Galatians 5, 22. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. We're up to meekness. And after meekness, there's temperance, and that's the end of it. Okay, so we're very close to the end. We're up to the second, last fruit of the Spirit that's mentioned in Galatians 5.22. Uh, we're looking at the topic of meekness. Now, you might be thinking, oh, man, I wanted a red-hot you know, sermon tonight. You know, Pastor Kevin's going to preach about meekness. And, you know, sometimes we, you know, I've, I've said it before, I think when we're looking at gentleness, sometimes we, we look at these topics and we think, oh, you know, that's not such an exciting topic. But, you know, the Lord, you know, in order for the Lord to make you a great person, okay, He's going to be looking at the person that is displaying these characteristics, okay? This is the fruit that God is trying to develop in your life, and you're going to be a more well-rounded Christian. You're going to be more useful to God, you know? And meekness is one of these things that God wants us to produce, meekness. Now, I don't know, you know, what you think about the term meekness, but uh, I'm going to quickly read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 1. And we looked at this verse before, I think when we were looking at uh, gentleness, yeah. Because it says here, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness, there's meekness, and gentleness. Now these are two fruits of the Spirit. Meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. So I want you to notice what Paul describes his fruits of the Spirit in his life, this meekness and his gentleness that he had toward the Corinthian church. He firstly says, this, these are qualities that are of Christ. You know, if we knew Jesus Christ on this earth, we would have known him as meek and gentle. And then he says, in order for him to be, uh, to, to be base, he says, who in presence and base among you. You know what he's saying? He's saying he's able to lower himself to the other believers and he's able to do that because he's got the fruits of meekness and gentleness okay to be lowly to be based among you you'll soon see that being lowly has a lot to do with being meek you know three words that are very similar in the bible and you may think they're all kind of similar are the words uh, meek lowly and humble now th th there is a lot in common with those these those three words okay but they are a little bit different from one another okay we are looking at the fruits of meekness tonight and why is meekness so important you know you know you, you may think again this is a, a weak character to have you know because people sometimes think of meek as weak that's not it's not the same thing okay being meek is not being weak in uh in matthew chapter 5 verse 5 it says blessed are the meek so, do you want to be blessed by God? Blessed are the meek. You need to be meek to be blessed by God. Then it says this, For they shall inherit the earth. Wow. You know what? We're, we're looking forward to a time when Christ is going to come back and establish His, His kingdom. And we're going to rule and reign with Christ. We've seen that many times. And we're going to be kings and priests in His kingdom. Well, you know what? If we want to inherit the earth, we want to have great uh, positions of authority and, and rule in, in the glory of Jesus Christ in the millennium. Hey, we want to do the best we can and have the highest positions serving Christ. Well, we need to start by being meek. Blessed are the meek, for they, the meek, shall inherit the earth. So, you know, don't tell me this is a fruit that's, you know, not important. You know, if God's saying, man, you, you're going to inherit the earth by being meek, then this is, this is one way we can ensure that we have high positions uh, you know, where we are giving thanks and, and great servitude to God during His millennial reign. Now, you're in Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to basically, uh, first of all, actually, before we look at Philippians chapter 2, I want to give you two dictionary definitions for the word meek. When you think of the word meek, and I, I found two meanings, and the first one that's in the dictionary is to be soft and gentle. Now, I think meekness can carry that term, soft and gentle, but we've already seen that gentleness was another fruit of the Spirit that was mentioned. Okay? So I don't believe meek, when we look at the topic of meekness in the Bible, that you know, the Lord uses gentleness to, to differentiate a, as a different fruit from meekness. Okay? So we already covered gentleness as a fruit of the Spirit. The second meaning for the word meek, as I kind of mentioned, are the words humble and lowly. You'll find that in your, most of your dictionaries. To be humble and lowly. Now, obviously... Uh, what, what I'm going to say to you is basically in order for you to be lowly, 
you have to be both humble and meek. Okay, now these two things, again, usually somebody that is meek, they're naturally going to be humble. Usually the person that's humble, they're naturally going to be meek. Okay, these are very similar characteristics, but they are a little bit different. Okay, so when you're humble, you're someone that does not speak highly of yourself, right? Humility is the opposite of pride. We think of pride as the opposite of someone that is humble. You don't speak, you know, great swelling words about yourself. You're not out there promoting yourself, trying to make yourself look like some, some big shot, okay? That would be humility. Meekness has more to do with how you look at others, okay? Again, that idea of being lowly. I'm going to lower myself compared to others. You know, I, I want to be a blessing to other people. I want to serve other people. So humility has more to do with how you look at yourself. Meekness has more to do with how you look at other people. But again, these things are so similar. You know, I truly believe someone that is meek will automatically be humble and the humble person will automatically be meek. But both of these thoughts, both of these ideas has to do with being lowly. You're lowering yourself. You know, you're not speaking highly of yourself. You're lowering yourself and you're lifting up others and lowering yourself compared to other people. You're in Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 3. Look what it says here. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 3, it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Now look what it says. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. So in order for you to be lowly, the Bible tells us we have to esteem other, each other, better than ourselves. Okay? Now this is something we need to remind ourselves when we come to church, and I promise you this, this is, I always tell myself this on my way to church. Always. The people that are going to be at church tonight, or this, uh, Sunday morning, they're better than me. I'm going to esteem them better than myself. Okay, and when I come to preach, I'm not just trying to fuel time. Oh, it's, we better have church. We better have a sermon. I don't think that way. You know, I think these are the children of God. Th th these right now, th these people that I'm preaching to are the most important people in God's eyes. You know, and so I better make sure that I, I do a good job, that, I, that I'm feeding them the word of God. I'm not trying to cut corners. I'm not just trying to get through some sermon. I want to make sure that you're full, that you're fed, and that God says, well done, you fed my children. Because you guys are truly the most important people, you know, in God's eyes. You know, right now in Fairfield East, gathered together, you are very important, okay? That's how the Lord sees us. We're, we're, we're His children, we're His kings, His priests, we're His ambassadors, we're His soldiers, okay? And we need to remind ourselves when we come to church, you know, whoever it is, it doesn't matter if it's someone that I don't necessarily get along with, I'm going to view that person as someone more important than me. This person is a child of God. Or if we have a visitor that is unsaved, this person needs to know what they have to do to be saved and I'm going to lower myself. I'm going to esteem that person and I'm going to give them the gospel so they can be saved as well. So they can have the same status as a child of God as other people in this church. You know, it's going to help you in church to serve one another when you just lift each other up. Point number one, I've got, some pra I've got four practical tips of staying meek. Point number one is when you come into church, think of everyone else as better than yourself. Can you do that, brethren? Can you? You know, we need to do that with the children. You know, it's so important for our children to feel like they're important and, and valued in church. You know, I, I try my best to say hello to the children. You know, try to greet them and maybe have a laugh with the kids because I want them to know they're important to this pastor. They're important to this church. You know, they're not just filling the seats. They're not just the children of brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so. Hey, they are the future. They're the future generation. They're, they're, they're going to be the ones that are, are running the church in the future, Lord willing. Okay? And if you don't make, make them feel important, if you don't make them feel valued, they're going to be thinking, well, you know what? My friends make me feel important. You know, the world makes me feel valued. Why? You know, as they grow up, they're going to be thinking, well, I wasn't important in church. You know, I, I can find that importance and that value somewhere else. And so I, I don't care how small the child is. You know, if they come into church, I'm going to esteem that person better than myself. You know, that is part of being meek, okay? It's by looking at others and lifting them higher than you view yourself. It's going to help you serve one another. Can you please turn to Matthew chapter 20? Matthew chapter 20, verse number 25. Matthew chapter 20 and verse number 25. I've moved the fridge here, by the way, if anyone's wondering. It's over here for now. I'm still trying to work out how the building's going to be arranged, still moving things around a little bit. Uh, but anyway, Matthew chapter 20 and verse number 25. 
Point number two, practical tip of staying meek. Point number two is view your position of authority and leadership. If you've got authority and leadership, okay, I have it in the church, I have it in my home, okay? If you are someone that is a leader or you have authority, view that position as a position of servitude, okay? Look at that position as a position of servitude. Rather than looking, how can people serve me because I'm the boss? No, you should be looking, how can I serve others? Okay, that's going to keep you meek. Matthew chapter 20, verse number 25. But Jesus called them unto him and said, You know that the princes, hey, those are the people of authority, okay, of the Gentiles, so when the Bible refers to Gentiles like this, it's re referring mainly to the non-believing world, right? So the authorities in the unbelieving world exercise dominion over them, and they are, sorry, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. So that's not wrong, that's not evil, okay? There's authority, you exercise authority, that's okay. But look at verse number 26. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Hey, you know what's another great title for the pastor? The minister. I like that title, the minister. You know what? Because I'm supposed to minister. You know, it's not about the church ministering to the pastor, you know, but it's about the pastor. That's my job. My job is to, even though I've been given the authority in the house of God, but it's my job to minister to you, to serve you, okay? When I preach, uh, prepare a sermon, it's to feed you, okay? And, and so this is the person that is great in the eyes of the Lord. If you have authority, if you have leadership, I don't care what position that is, it might be in your workplace, hey, view it as a position of servitude. As children of God, we ought to be looking at our authority and leader position differently from the Gentiles, differently from the world, who are seeking for others to serve them. Let's keep going. Verse number uh, 27. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ explains this many ways. Okay? If you want to be the chief, guess where you're going to start? You've got to start serving. Hey, and when you're the chief, you, you continue serving. Serving, the, serving whoever it is that is under you. Verse number 28. Even, this is the best part of it, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Boy, was Jesus Christ meek? Yeah. He was able to esteem others higher and says, you know what? I'm going to give up my life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be that sacrifice. I'm going to take on the sins of the world. And of course, Christ had to lower himself in order to do that. Okay. So if you find it challenging to lower yourself, if you find it challenging to serve those that are under your authority, then remind yourself of what Christ has done. Now, Jesus Christ also says in Luke 14, 11, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth, humbleth himself shall be exalted. Boy, I want to be promoted by God. Now, I want God to be the one that gives me uh, the promotions, that, that lifts me up, but in order for that to happen, you have to lower yourself. You have to become humble. You have to become meek. You have to view others better than yourselves. All right? Now, what am I talking about? You know, husbands, you know, you, you are the head of your home. Okay? And as the head of your home, your job is not to go, well, how do I get served? Now, it's great to be served as a husband. Nothing wrong with that. I, I love it when my wife cooks, you know, a hearty meal and I get served by my wife or, or my kids do the chores and they run around and do something great for me or something. Hey, that's great to serve the, you know, the ones that are in authority. But at the same time, it's your job to serve as well. You know, husbands, it's your job to serve your wife. You know, mothers, it's your job to serve your children. Employers, it's your job to serve your employees. Pastors, it's your job to serve the local church. Say, what are you talking about? And if I was serving my kids, mother, you know, parents thinking, if I was serving my kids, you know, my kids would be like, Let, let's, let's fly to America and go to Disneyland or something. Is, is that what you mean? You know, just, just run around and, and let the kids decide what they're going to do? No, that's not what I mean by servitude. That's going to spoil your children. That's going to destroy your children. Okay? You know, when I, you know, I don't work a full-time job outside of church anymore. This is my full-time job. But obviously when I had my, my full-time job, why would I go and work? Why is it that you go and work hard and, and, and get, up at, you know, uh, get your paycheck and, and bring it home? The reason for it is you're going to serve your family. My, it's my job as a leader to make sure that my wife is served, that my children are served, that they have what they need. That's what service is. 
And, and for mothers, I know some of you homeschool. Hey, you know what? When you're teaching your children, when, when you're giving them knowledge and wisdom, you know what you're doing? You're serving your children. So it's not about what they want to do, and that's what I mean by serving them. No, you know what? It's, it's about how do I profit these people that are under my authority? How is it that I can be a help to this person under my authority? If you're an employer and you have a poor performing employee, you say, how can I serve this employee? How is it that I can help him get him to the point where he needs to be uh, hitting his targets and being productive? And what, is it, what, what tools can I give him? Is it training? Is, is it resources? What does he need in order for him to be a productive employee? And when you look at things like that, what you're doing is you're serving those that are under your authority. That's what I mean by serving those under your authority. That's what I mean by serving your children. Ultimately, your goal is to serve Christ okay, in the authority that you've been given. Can you please turn to... I should have got you to stay in Philippians. Anyway, turn to Acts chapter 20 for me. Turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. You know, if you get a promotion at work or something like that, the unbelieving world, I've seen it. They're, honestly, they're so excited. All right, all right, I've got people under me. You know, I'm going to get served. That's honestly how the unbelieving world thinks. You, as God's people, you know, when you're taking a position of authority, you ought to be saying, how can I serve those under me? How can I improve these people? How can I help these people that are under me? Okay. Now, you're in Acts chapter 20 and verse number 33. I'll, I'll, I'll just read to you Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 4 first. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 4, it says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. I'll read that again. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So there's nothing wrong to look at your own things, but that shouldn't be the only thing you're focused on. What do I need? How do I need to be served? That's not how you should be looking uh, and considering your life. You should be saying, hey, what is it that others need? How can I be a help? to others. You know, point number three um, that I have for you to, uh, to stay meek is that at every opportunity, ask how can I be a blessing to this person or to others? How can I be a blessing to others? That should be your every opportunity. How can I be a blessing to others? You know, sometimes people confuse meekness with shyness. Okay? Now, believe it or not, I'm kind of like a naturally shy person. Okay, some of, my, some of my family know that, okay? And say, so, well, you know, some of us, like, I, I get up to preach and sometimes I yell and whatever, I carry on. And people don't think I'm shy because you, you're doing that, right? And, and, you know, and that's how some, some people think, okay? What's the difference with shyness and meekness, though? Well, you know, the problem with being shy, now, nothing wrong with being shy, okay? But what happens is, when, you, when you're shy, you tend to be self-focused, okay? Self-indulged. You know, and so someone might walk past in church and I'm too shy to say hello. I'm a shy person. Okay. The problem with that though, you're thinking about yourself. What's meekness? Remember, it's how you view others. It's how you view others. Okay. So if you're naturally a shy person, what's going to get you to, you, you know, to, to be more outgoing, okay, and to bless others and to serve others is to say, hey, this person that I'm shy to speak to, you know, they're more important than me feeling comfortable. You know, me in my comfort zone, being quiet, not saying hello, not saying anything. That person is more important to me than how comfortable I feel. It's more important to me that I'm going to make this person feel comfortable. I'm going to make this person feel important. So I'm going to, even though I'm shy, even though I'm going to get outside of my comfort zone, I'm going to go to that person and, and they're more important than me. And so I, I care more about them being comfortable than me being comfortable. That's meekness. Okay, that's meekness. So it's not about just, oh, I'm shy, I'm not going to interact. Hey, well, if that's you, you need to work on that because that's not a good character to have. Okay? Where, where you're not getting out, you've got to get outside of your comfort zone. You've got to view others as important. Okay? Because when you, when you are shy and, and I'm too shy to speak to this person, what you are saying is you are not important enough to me for me to get out of my comfort zone. It's more important for me to just be shy and quiet than to make you feel important and, and to bless you, to serve you, okay? So, if you're naturally shy, you say, well, you know what, I need to turn this into meekness. I need to esteem others better than myself. 
and I need to get out of my comfort zone, get out of my position of, of you know, and, and make sure others around me feel like I, they're important to me. Okay? Now, where did I get to turn to? Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 33. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 33. <clears throat> These are the words of Paul. He says, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands, so these are the hands of Paul, speaking out of his own hands, have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. Wow. So the Apostle Paul, high authority, highest authority as an apostle. You know, be, be, you know it's, it's the highest office that was held by men. Okay? The, apostle, the office of the apostle. And he says, you know what? In, instead of me, I, I never coveted people's wealth. You know, I, I, he never got into the ministry for wealth. He never got into the ministry to see how much money he can make. He says, you know what? I can be in the ministry and I can make sure that I, with my own hands, can provide my, for myself and also these others and to them that were with me. You know, Paul had other people on his missionary journeys. He had other people that were helping him in his ministry. And you know what? We know that Paul, one of his jobs was a tent maker. You know, he made sure, well, you know what? We don't have enough money coming in from the church. I'm going to make sure that I get out there and provide and, and make sure that we have what we need to serve the churches before me. Okay? So you can see that Paul had a mindset. I've got to look after these other people. I'm going to minister unto these other people, even though he held the highest office in the New Testament for a man. Okay? Look at verse number 35. I have showed you all things. How that so laboring, ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So why did Paul go out and work and provide for himself? He wanted to set a good example. You know, we need to be people that think about how do I give to others? Rather than thinking, how is it that I can receive? You know, it's more blessed to give than to receive. You know, this is something that children have to learn. You know, because children naturally, they look forward to the Christmas presents. They look, they look forward to the birthday presents. You know, children naturally, you know, what is it that I can get? You know, and as they grow, okay, and maybe they make a bit of money, a bit of pocket money, and then it's like, well, you know, your brother's birthday's coming up. And, and so you've got you to start training them. Hey, you've got to think about others, you know. You can use that pocket money on yourself or, you know, your brother's birthday's coming up. I feel sorry for my kids because there's so many birthdays. But anyway, like, you know, someone's birthday's coming up. Are you going to think about others? Are you going to think about your siblings? And th this is not a natural thing. You, you've got to grow into that. And, and, and uh, you know, and as you get into adulthood, and, and those of you that have served others, those of you that have helped others, maybe even like a big financial help or something like that, you know that it feels good. You know that, man, I, I did that, and, and brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, they've been blessed, they've been encouraged, they got out of this bad situation, and it just feels great. It feels like, you know what, Lord, thank you for using me to be a blessing to other people. And you can truly start to learn as you get into adulthood, you know, this, this true saying that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Can you please turn to Colossians chapter 3? Colossians chapter 3 for me. Colossians chapter 3. So three points that I have so far, the practical tips of staying meek. Number one was when you come into church, think of everyone as better than you. Number two, view your positions of authority or leadership as positions of servitude. And number three, at every opportunity of interaction, ask how can I be a blessing to this person? Okay. Now point number four, well, let's have a look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 17. Now, if you ever ask me, Pastor, what is your life verse? Like, wh what are the verses that you sort of live by or you try to live by? Because I'm not perfect, right? <laughs> you know, what are the verses that you try to live by? Well, these are the ones. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 17. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 17 reads, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Boy, what a challenge. So whatever it is that we, whatever we say, the word, or our deeds, whatever we do, we should do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, we've done a lot of, to, we've done a lot of things today before coming to church. We've probably said a lot of things today before coming to church. 
Can you honestly say to me, brethren, that everything I said and did was in the name of Jesus Christ? Don't you think that thought's going to change how you live your life? Man, everything I say and do has to honor Jesus. Okay, it has to honor Jesus. Giving thanks to God and the Father by Him, giving, giving God thanks with everything that you're able to accomplish. Now look at verse, drop down to verse number 22. Because it's verse number 22 that I would call my life verses, or verse, right? This is what I try to live by. Verse number 22. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness, singleness of heart, fearing God. Verse number 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Boy, you know, whatever you do in life, brethren, do it as unto the Lord. I've preached in this already. I can't remember what sermon I preached, but I think it needs to be repeated. All right? You may not like your job. You might think it's this boring, mundane role that I have. You may not like your boss. Okay? But you know what? You go to work as though you're working for the Lord Jesus. It's not just church. You know, people say, oh, I need to get into full-time ministry. And they think about church. Listen, you can make whatever you're in, whatever position you're in, that ought to be your full-time ministry to the Lord Jesus. Whatever you do, you do it as unto the Lord and not unto men. Not as men pleasers, but unto the Lord. You know, for those of you that went out working today, how'd you perform? I hope you, I hope you performed well. You know, I hope in your heart you said, you know what, I'm going to work as though Jesus asked me to do this job. You know, whatever authority that the Lord has put over me, I'm going to view this as Jesus. You know, if Jesus Christ walked into this church tonight, walked through the doors, and asked you to do something, would you do it? What if he said, hey, you know, brother, oh, I won't name any names, but you know, what if Jesus Christ comes in, right, and says, look, I need you to clean the toilet. Would you clean the toilet? Amen. I hope so. And, and how well would you clean it? You know, would you just give it a quick wipe down? Or would you just make sure that there's like literally every stain is removed out of that? And of course, you know, if Christ came and asked us to do something, not only would we do it, I, I believe your heart's in the right place, not only would you do it, but you would do the best job you can possibly do. You know, you, you may not do a perfect job, but you will do the best with what you have. Okay, I, I truly believe that. Okay, if Christ came and asked you to do that. And so we ought, that's how we ought to live though. I know I'm kind of giving it like an imaginary situation. What if Jesus came in? But that's how we're meant to live our lives. Whatever it is that we do. Okay, I get up to preach. I have to be do it. And it truly, because this is the house of God. I mean, Jesus Christ has literally asked me to preach his word. So, you know, I've got to do the best I can. But, you know, a lot of you guys aren't going to be pastors. A lot of you guys aren't going to get behind the pulpit and preach. That doesn't mean that you've missed out on this opportunity to serve Christ. You serve him on the job. Okay, regardless of what position it is. Okay, you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 24. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 24. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. You serve the Lord Christ. It's not saying pastors serve the Lord Christ. It's not saying missionaries serve the Lord Christ. It's saying you, for ye, that's ye all, plural, serve the Lord Christ, regardless of what position you're in. So and I keep saying this because I, I, truly, I truly believe the Lord wants to promote many of us in our, in our workplaces, in our jobs. I truly believe the Lord, and I'm not, trying, I'm not this prosperity preacher here. I'm not saying the Lord's going to go, you know, give you this huge, you know, millions of dollars and mansions and stuff like that. But I truly believe the Lord wants to give you great positions, you know, stable jobs and, and high paying jobs where you can provide and not have to worry about those things so you can give your time to the Lord Jesus Christ. But many times you're just holding yourself back. You know, you're just being lazy. I'll just do the minimum. You know, I don't really want to go to work today. You know, you're just doing the least you can and you're not thinking that you're serving Christ. You know what? You serve Christ. What does it say there? Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. That's the best, the best part of working a job and giving your best. Is knowing I'm not just going to walk away with a paycheck. But Christ is going to reward me as well. Whatever that might look like in your life. Might be blessings on this life. 
might be greater rewards in heaven. Regardless, whatever it is, brethren, the Lord Jesus Christ wants to reward you. Hey, you, 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 if you're slack on the job, you do the bare minimum, you cheat, you know, you, you, you do less hours and you say you've done things like that, how is the Lord going to reward you? How is the Lord going to bless you if you take that kind of attitude as a servant? You know, whoever it is that you serve, make sure that when they ask you to do something, you remind yourself it's like the Lord Jesus Christ has just asked me to do that. Unless they're asking you to sin. That's a different topic, okay? You say, what extent do I take this? You know, thinking about everything I do, do it unto the Lord. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, I'll just read it to you. It says, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So even when you eat, and you're, you're not thinking or drinking, right? You're not even thinking this is for the Lord. He says, do it as, as, as to the Lord. Do it to the glory of God. Even the small things, brethren, like eating and drinking, this will transform your life. This will change your life, okay? When you just say to yourself, Jesus has asked me to do whatever it is that he's asked me to do, and I'm going to do the best I can. I'm not going to do it like a men pleaser. I'm going to do it unto the Lord. I'm going to make sure that whatever I say, whatever I do, it glorifies the Lord. It's going to transform your life. I promise you that. Can you please turn to Numbers uh, chapter 12? Numbers chapter 12. It's not easy lowering yourself. It's not easy viewing others as esteem them higher than yourself. It's not easy. Because you look at others and you know they've got their faults and their problems. Why should I see myself lower than that person? And I think sometimes as Christians, we, uh, we're concerned about being meek because the thought is, well, people will take advantage of me if I have a meek dispens- disposition. Like, you know, I- I've got to show myself strong. You know, I've got to set up boundaries and walls and I've got to make sure that people realize they just can't step all over me and push me around and backstab me. And, but pastor, you know, being meek, that opens me up to be attacked. You know, that, that opens me up to be stepped on. You know, is that really what God wants from us? Well, while you're turning to Numbers 12, I want to read to you from Psalm 147 and verse number 6. Psalm 147, verse number 6. It says, The Lord lifteth up the meek. And then it says this, He casts off the wicked down to the ground. So what is it again? The Lord lifteth up the meek. You know what? If you're concerned about, well, if I'm meek, someone's going to take advantage of me. You know what? Let them take advantage of you. Let them step on you a little bit. Because you know what? The Lord's going to lift you up and the Lord's going to take the wicked and cast him to the ground. That's what's going to happen. These are the promises of God. That's what what he means. You don't have to worry, how do I... Oh, Pastor, I can't be me because, you know, I know this person's going to do me wrong. Just let them do you wrong. You, you want to be promoted by God? You want to be lifted by God? Well, that means you've got to let some people do you wrong. <laughs> you've got to take the view, where I'm, going to, I'm going to be meek regardless. You know, hopefully I get blessed and, you know, there's a potential that I might be stepped on. But if I get stepped on, I know the Lord's going to take care of that and the Lord will lift me up. Look at Numbers, Numbers chapter 12 and verse number 1. Numbers chapter 12 and verse number 1. This uh, follows after the exodus, you know, Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt. In Numbers chapter 12, verse number 1, And Miriam and Aaron, so that's the sister and brother of Moses, spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So his brothers weren't happy that he had taken this Ethiopian woman uh, as his wife. I guess they thought you should be taking one of the Israelites, you know, Uh, you know. This is, this, you know, some people think, you know, the, the Jews, they never mixed. They never intermingled, right? They kept themselves pure to these days. Yeah, Moses, the one that led him out of Egypt, um, is already married to an African, right? Married to an Ethiopian. But, hey, they had a problem with that. Verse number two. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses, look at this, was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Wow. I mean, when we think of Moses, we think of a great leader. We think of a man that was greatly used by God. He took on Pharaoh. He took on the mites of the world. Right? And the Lord says, well, he was very meek. So what does this teach us? We wouldn't be great for the Lord. Don't we have to be very meek? 
So meek was he that he was, he was the most meek person on the face of the earth. Of all his contemporaries that he lived on the earth, the Lord looked and said, you know what, who's the most meek person? Oh, it's Moses. He's the one that I'm going to use to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. He's the one I'm going to use to do great works for God. So meekness is so important. Look at verse number four. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation, and they three came out. And the Lord came down in a pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. So the Lord, you know, knowing that Aaron and Miriam were against Moses at this point in time, you know, were speaking against him, the Lord called both of these, both of his siblings to come and to speak to him. I want you to notice what he says about uh, um, Moses. Verse number six. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. So the Lord's saying, look, if, if amongst your nation there's a prophet, if I'm going to pull out a prophet, I'm going to speak to him in visions. Okay, so that's understandable. We know many times the prophets in the Bible receive their vision from the Lord. Okay, why is the Lord saying this? Because he's going to compare Moses to the other prophets. Look what he says about Moses. It says in verse number, uh, verse number seven, my servant Moses is not so. Who is faithful in all mine house? So this is, look, he says, look, to the prophets, I'm going to speak to them in visions. But to Moses, no. That's not how I'm going to speak to him. Look at verse number eight. He says, with him, with Moses, will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. So the Lord says, you know what? Moses is so important to me. I, I would normally speak to prophets in visions. But to Moses, as the, as the one who's the most meek on the earth, I'm going to speak to him mouth to mouth. He's going to see him. We saw that when he came down from Mount Sinai, his face shone. He had seen the glory of the Lord. You know, the Lord had a very personal, close walk with Moses. Why? Because he was the most meek on the earth. You want to have a, a good fellowship with the Lord, a good walk with the Lord? You've got, to, you've got to find that meekness in you. Okay? Look at verse number 10. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. So Moses, meek, okay? And again, yeah, meek, you're gonna, if, you, if you're meek, you're going to set yourself up to be a target. People are going to try to take advantage of you. People are going to try to walk over you. Hey, Moses' siblings took advantage of that. They tried to criticize him about the, the woman he had married. Hey, but what, what did God do? He lifted up Moses. He lifted up Moses and he cast down the wicked to the ground. He took care of that situation. Okay? So don't be afraid of being meek. Don't be afraid of esteeming others higher. Don't be afraid of serving other people. Okay? And if they, if they do you wrong and they don't say thank you, they don't you know, appreciate what you've done, just let the Lord balance those books. Just let the Lord sort it out. Okay? It, it, I, I'd, you know what? I'd rather be taken advantage of knowing that God will lift me up. That's how I feel. <laughs> I mean, what could be better than the Lord lifting you up? Well, then some, you've got to be meek. Okay? You've got to be meek and, and allow yourself to be sometimes taken advantage of. Now, again, when we look at these, this idea of meek or humility, you know, we, we saw that the opposite of that is pride. You know, the, the proud hearts. And, uh, you know, the sin of pride is, is one of the worst sins I can think of, you know, because we all have it, and I have it, we all have it. The worst thing about pride is others can see the pride in you, and you at the same time think you're not proud. Like, <laughs> you know what, like other sins that you've done, it's like obvious, like everyone knows you've done that sin or whatever, right? You can't really hide it. But pride, you know, people, people look at you by your behavior and your words, they know, this person is very proud. But you, no, I'm humble. You know, that's just how, that's how it is. It's sort of this silent sin. It's very hard to detect uh, within yourself. But if you can please turn to Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 18, and we'll go to a very famous story there. The story of the, um, the Pharisee and the publican that were praying to the Lord. 
Luke 18, verse number 10. Luke 18, verse number 10. Now, if you know the story well, the publican was very humble, okay, in, in his approach to the Lord. And the Pharisee was full of pride. But look at verse number 10. It says, Two men went up into the, into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Now look, the things that he says about himself, they're not wrong, right? I mean, I think any of us would look at what he just said and say, yeah, I would like to be that person. I would like to be a person that is not unjust. I don't want to be an adulterer. You know, I don't want to be an extortioner. I want to be someone that fasts on a regular basis. I want to make sure I give my tithe of what I possess. Now, these aren't bad characteristics, right? And so it's, it's not like these things are wrong to attain or, or, or aim for in your life, okay? But what is he doing? He's lifting himself up. He's speaking highly of himself, right? He's full of pride. He's not humble. He's not lowly. He's not meek. He's bragging. That's what the sin is. He's bragging about all the great things that he has done. Look at verse number 14. Uh, sorry, 13. 13. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So the publican says, you know what? I'm not even going to talk about my good works. I'm, I'm a sinner. God, be merciful to me. I've, I've done wrong. I, I've broken your laws. I've broken your commands. Verse number 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts of himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. You know, no one likes self-promoters. You know, even, even when I get up to preach and I have to give like a story illustration, I think about something in my life, I'm like, oh, I don't, you know, it's going to help the sermon, but I don't want people to think that I'm trying to promote myself. Like, I'm, you know, I don't want people to think that I'm just boasting of myself, but it's probably, the, you know, it's something that comes to mind as you prepare and you think about something, something that's real and practical. And, uh, but you know, no one likes people that are self-promoters. Now, to their face, it may seem like people like self-promoters, but really they don't. Like internally, they don't like that, okay? And uh, sometimes we see this out, you know, out in the world, self-promoters. I mean, that's where, that's how a lot of people get, get positions of authority, in that they step on other people and, and lift themselves up and promote themselves. But you know, I've also seen this in church. I've seen self-promoters. I've, I've seen people that just talk up their good works in church to make them seem like there's something more than they are. You know, where, where, and, and again, it's not that they've done wrong things. They've done great things. They've served the Lord. They served the church. You know, they've been, in, they've been uh, maybe Sunday school teachers for 10 years, 20 years. You know, that maybe they've sung in the choir for 15 years. You know, maybe they've done this or done that for the church. And, you know, I've met people like this that, yeah, it's, it's great that you've done this. It's great that you've served. But then after you serve, you better shut up. Because then you're like, oh, promote, look what I've done. Well, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this. Boy. That's your reward. The praise of men is your reward. You know, I mean, the last thing you want to do is serve God with your life and then you go to heaven and the Lord says, well, your reward was on the earth. <laughs> you know, everyone that pat you on the back for the, you know, well done, good job, you know, that's your reward and you don't get nothing in heaven. You know, this can happen to Christians as well. You know, nobody likes self-promoters. And I, I don't know if anyone here is that way, but if you feel, if you think, yeah, you know what, that's kind of me. I kind of talk myself up. I, I say I talk about all the past accomplishments and all the great things that I've done. Well, you need to lower yourself a little bit to take down that pride. Like everyone else around you knows that you're proud, okay? And you just haven't realized it. You need to take it down, okay? Now, you're still there in Luke 18. I want to, the, the main thing that I wanted to focus on was what about, what, we're about to read in verse number nine. We're just going back up. Why did Jesus Christ tell this story though about the Pharisee and the publican? Okay, well, look at verse number nine. It's a, it, the Bible tells us why he did this. Luke 18, verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous, look at this, and despised others. The proud, the person that's full of pride, the person that exalts himself, that elevates himself above, above others. It's not just that they think well of themselves, they actually despise other people around them. Okay, that's why no one likes the proud. 
Like no one likes a person that speaks highly of themselves because you know they don't just do that, they speak down to you. You know, they despise others. This is, you know, you, you need to overcome pride, brethren. It's, I have it, you have it, we all, we all have it. We all struggle with pride. You know, when someone tells you something and, you know, it might, may be the truth and you don't like it, and you get worked up and emotional about it, that's pride. Okay? Your boss tells you to do something at, at work, I don't want to do that. That's pride. Remember, your boss asks you, yes, Jesus, in your head. Jesus, yes, I'll do that. I'll do the best I can when you ask me to do that, regardless of what it is. Okay? You've got to take down the pride. Okay? Pride, and again, it's that secret sin is actually the despising of other people. Okay? Which is obviously the opposite of meekness. Meekness is about viewing others and elevating them higher than yourself. So can you please now go to Proverbs 16? We're going to end on Proverbs 16, which we're, we had the reading from. Proverbs 16. <clears throat> so we'll just end here in the, the book of wisdom. But Proverbs 16, verse 18. It's so important that we get lowly, that we get meek, that we, we become humble. It's so important that we develop this fruit in our lives, brethren. Because look at verse number 18, Proverbs 16, verse 18. It says, pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. Haughty also means pride, pride someone that lifts themselves up. Okay? It, you need to overcome pride. It's going to lead you to destruction. It comes before destruction. Okay? When, when you realize there's pride in your life, you need to say to yourself, I need to fix this now, because I'm not, I, I don't know how many steps away I am from destruction, from destroying myself. Okay? And haughty his spirit before a fall. I don't know how far I am from this great fall. I better work on this fruit of meekness. Lord, please give me this fruit. You gave it to Mo Moses, had it. You know, you made him a great man. You promoted Moses as the leader of the whole nation by being meek. Okay? Look at verse number 19. Better it is to be of an humble spirit. Now, with the lowly. So lowly means, again, those that are low themselves the meek, the humble, than to divide the spoil with the proud. What is he saying? He says the lowly people, humble people, meek people, like good people, they want to be around other humble people. That's what he's saying. They don't want to divide the spoil with the proud. They don't want to spend time with the proud. They don't want to spend, you know, uh, be in fellowship with the proud. Remember that when, you, when you're full of pride. Remember that when you talk yourself up and you elevate yourself, other people don't like it. Again, maybe in your face, they'll say, oh, good job. It may look like they like you, but really they don't. Okay? Humble people want to be with other lowly people. Okay? Fellowship with other lowly people. Make friends with other lowly people. Now, please go to verse number 5 in the same chapter. Proverbs chapter 16, we'll end on this one. Proverbs 16, verse number 5. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. So I wanted to end on this one because that word abomination is a very strong word. You know, the Lord has a lot of things that he hates, that he calls abominable, you know, abomination, okay? I mean, this is like the lowest of the low you can possibly go in the eyes of God. Well, you know what? Pride is an abomination to the Lord. So this means we need to work. God, ask God, God, please develop meekness in me. Lord, this pride that I have in me, just take it away, Lord. It's in my flesh. Help me to overcome this pride, okay? We all have it again, you know? It's, all, it's always there. But Lord, you need to help me have a meek disposition about me. You know, when someone asks something that is difficult, I, I want to take the meek approach, not the proud approach. You know, when my boss asks me to do something at work, Lord, help me to be meek. When my pastor asks me to do something, Lord, help me to be meek. Children, when my parents ask me to clean up my room, help me to be meek, help me to be lowly. Help me to do it as unto the Lord. So brethren, the fruit of meekness, it'll make you great. The fruit of meekness, it'll cause the Lord to elevate you, to lift you, to lift you up, to give you, you know, positions and, and, and uh, leadership and, uh, and authority above what you truly thought. Okay? But it starts with the fruit of meekness. Let's pray.